When the Trade Federation started to build their secret army, they had a vision of converting their enormous cargo haulers into military transports. It's hard to overestimate how enormous this ship is, and just how many droids and vehicles could fit inside. For this video, we've hacked into a vulture droid to give us a tour of a Lucre Hulk over Ryloth, but we'll also use some schematics and information gathered through the holonet. With all this information, we'll be able to review its overall size, speed, armament, and complement of droids and ships. We'll also look at some of its flaws, and how its role changed over the course of the Clone Wars. Let's start by looking at some of the raw stats on its size. At a length of 3,170 meters, or nearly 2 miles, it was nearly twice the length of the Imperial Star Destroyer. Even its width of 3,009 meters, or 1.86 miles, meant that it was more than two Venators across. And just its height alone was 1,029 meters, or 0.63 miles, making it taller than a Victory-class Star Destroyer is long, and nearly the same height as four Venators stacked on top of each other. If it arrived on Earth, it would be nearly as wide as Manhattan, and more than twice the height of the Empire State Building. But all those numbers really just meant one very important thing, that it could haul a lot of stuff. If we fly by some of the hangar bays, you can see how small the C-9979 landing ship looks sitting inside of the Lucre Hulk. Fifty of these landing craft could be internally docked, essentially allowing a whole planetary invasion fleet to be moved through hyperspace with this one massive ship. The Lucre Hulk had a Class II hyperdrive, which is quite impressive as that's the same speed as some starfighters, faster than many cargo ships, while being tied with an Imperial Class Star Destroyer. So though the C-9979 didn't have a hyperdrive, 50 of them could just pop up in your atmosphere in no time. The real crazy stats come in when you start to look at what would be carried inside of these landing craft. Each one could transport 11 MTTs, 114 AATs, and 28 platoon attack crafts. Times that by 50, and we get a stunning 550 MTTs, 5,700 AATs, and 1,400 PACs. And the Trade Federation even used some extra space in these hangars to store some additional tanks, which were a variety of NRN99 snail tanks, and usually an extra 550 armored assault tanks. I didn't even mention the battle droids yet, which usually included 139,000 battle droids. One potential problem could have been a long queue of ships, as all these landing craft were stuck behind each other waiting to fly out of the hangar bays, but remember, this was originally a trade ship. Time is money, even in the galaxy far, far away, so there are multiple bays not only lining the sides of this inner circle, but also several bays located on the main core structure. This allowed for rapid deployment of its massive armada, a feature that would become one of the CIS's most feared capabilities. During the war, it wasn't just a terror on offense, but its 4 million metric ton capacity meant that a single Lucre Hulk could resupply a huge portion of CIS assets. Back with our tour guide, we can fly around these structures jutting out near the circle's opening. These first two larger clamps can be used to attach the Lucre Hulk to both planetary and space repair stations, or to hold allied capital ships like the Providence or Munificent class in place while assets are transferred. Moving deeper, you'll see these additional series of smaller clamps that are of different shapes to accommodate a wide variety of medium-sized ships. You might have noticed these two large areas bulging out on top here, and these are the long arrays of tractor beam projectors used to guide ships safely into the hangar or into one of the clamps. Because this opening is the main traffic area, the core sphere is ideally located, with the control bridge tower located right up top here. These dishes allowed for communication with a large amount and wide variety of different ships, with space traffic control also assisted by these side bridge towers that give a great view of the hangar bays on the inside of the ring. Flying around, down, and into the core, we see this area houses a main reactor. By taking a look at the schematics, we can see that this area houses a series of power generator assemblies, and above this area is the main droid control computer systems. This section connects the center sphere to the circle, but it also houses additional reactors and generators, leading up to a pair of main reactors for the engines. You can't see the second one in this image, but there are two of these, the starboard side one being right over here. What's crazy is that with all this power generation, the Trade Federation still had to install extra power generators throughout the hangar just so they could charge up their Starfighter complement. In an amazingly efficient use of space, its 1500 Vulture Droid complement could lock into recharge racks located in the ceiling of the hangar bay. Stored like bats, they hung above the C9979s, allowing them to load and unload without these fighters being in the way. 
All this makes it a bit ironic that it would be a vulture droid that accidentally sends Anakin's fighters spinning into the Lucre Hulk's hangar bay. Anakin fires at these added reactors put in place to charge the vultures, an explosion that would set off a chain reaction blowing up these charge stations spread throughout the ring. This eventually set off the reactors that lined that connection area, and right up into the core. Remember, that is where the droid control computers are located, along with its crew up in those bridge towers. Those would have contained a staff of 25 OOM pilot droids, which were designated by their blue coloring, along with at least 10 organic supervisors, almost always Nymordians. Though it should be pointed out that later T-Series droids were allowed to command Lucre Hulks during the Clone Wars. When this core was destroyed, the droid computer stopped sending its signal, which was transmitted down to the B-1 battle droids via its 16 signal stations. These dishes rounding the circle were all assisted by these spires, and the largest dish on the Lucre Hulk located at the rear. These transmission towers act like enormous antennas, and when all this tech got blown up, the battle droids collapsed. The original B1s had all of their movements directed by the Lucre Hulk, but this disaster on Naboo caused the later CIS to implement battle droids with an internal droid AI. They would still receive their orders from CIS leaders, but could figure out novel ways to carry out those missions if the orders stopped coming. Going past this main sensor array, we can see the engines, which were all produced by Rendili Star Drive. Despite how large they are, its top atmospheric speed was only 500 km per hour, or 311 miles per hour, about half the speed of the Imperial Star Destroyer and Venator. Now because it was not designed as a military ship, there are some design shortcomings. Although there are 42 quad turbo laser emplacements, there are some areas of the ship that are not defended, and the ones located on the inside of the ring run the fear of missing their target and firing into the Lucre Hulk itself. This is a problem that is made even worse by the fact that the core contains the reactors, the larger of the power generator assemblies, and the control bridge. That is a lot of trust to put into your automated targeting systems, so let's hope they have better targeting programming than the B1s. Though I am making it a bit worse than it sounds, as the core was protected by an incredibly powerful deflector shield generator, something you can actually see when the Naboo starfighters couldn't damage this area. The deflector shield is too strong! But still, you don't want to be firing into your own shields with powerful quad turbo lasers. At the end of the day though, the Lucre Hulk was one of the most useful ships in the history of the galaxy, and definitely crucial to the CIS war effort. During the Clone War, they would be seen in major battles, and often used as planetary blockades. These things did have a Class II hyperdrive, so even when the war came to an official end, some opportunists made these disappear into obscure parts of the galaxy. Some became Separatist holdouts, while one was actually used in a failed attack on the Death Star, and even as a rebel training ground. And this Lucre Hulk Flight Academy was actually commanded by General Hera Syndulla. We will cover these surviving Lucre Hulks in a separate video, but you definitely want to hear some cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. Its name, Lucre Hulk, comes from the word lucrative, which means to make a lot of profit, and although it first appeared in The Phantom Menace, its stats were later revealed in the Episode 1 Cross Sections book, and other Star Wars source books. And although there is no official cost, there are some sources that point out that on the black market, you could get one for 40 million credits. And a neat little detail is that supposedly, each of those quad turbolaser turrets could recess back into the ship, useful during that time when the Trade Federation was starting to use these as warships, but didn't want to give away these retrofittings. So that's it for the Lucre Hulk. I think this is one of the most important ships in the CIS, but let me know what you guys think about it in the comments down below. Do you like the ship's design? Was it a great way to move a ton of assets at once, or was it too much stored on a single ship? If you made it this far, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more content like this. If you want to connect with us, help support this channel, or get your own copies of the reference materials used to make this video, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, the Lucre Hulk is the Russian nesting doll of the CIS, and the Force will be with you. Always.